Right, we're in Second Samuel chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter. So, Second Samuel chapter 2 says this. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahanaim of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took men who, the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. When David was told that it was the men from Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messages, that messages, messengers to them to say to them, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul, your master, is dead, and the people of Judah have anointed them king anointed me king over them. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead, Ashuri, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all of Israel. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. The tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, together with, uh, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, were left Mahanaim and went to Gibeon. <coughs> Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David's men went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. One group sat down on one side of the pool and one group on the other. Then Abner said to Joab, let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand, in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and were counted, 12 men for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and 12 for David. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side and they fell down together. So that place in Gibeon was called Helkath Hazurim. The battle that day was very fierce and Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left as he pursued him. Abner looked behind him and asked, Is that you, Asahel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or to the left, take on one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned Asahel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was setting, they came to the hill of Ammah near Gia on the, west, on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on top of the hill. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Joab answered, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight anymore. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah. They crossed the Jordan, continued through the morning hours, and came to Mahanaim. Then Joab stopped pursuing Abner and assembled the whole army. Besides Asahel, 19 of David's men were found missing, but David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. They took Asahel and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron at daybreak. Right, so the context from last week in particular and from the end of 1 Samuel is that Saul is dead. 
Uh, prophecy has come to pass. It was foretold, wasn't it, that Saul's dynasty was going to end, Saul was ultimately going to die, and the kingship was going to be passed on to David. David had been anointed when he was just a shepherd boy a long time ago, and has been waiting for quite a long time to be installed as the king. Uh, and in that intervening period, uh, he remained faithful to Saul. He had lots of opportunities to kill him, uh, and people told him he should kill him. His, his own soldiers were saying, well, just kill him now and he'll be king. Do it. But David repeatedly said, no, I'm not going to raise a hand against the Lord's anointed. David repeatedly waited and trusted that God's plan and God's time in front to become king would be best. That's why last week with Daz, when you were looking at it, David is so shocked that anybody would have the audacity to kill the Lord's anointed. So that guy comes to his knee and says, look, I've, I, I, I ran, ran Saul through, basically he's dead. And even though we, we know that likelihood is he was lying and it wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with that, David's point to him is, well, either that's not, that's not something to joke about or it's not something to do. Why would you raise a hand against the Lord's anointed? Now, that's where we're, we're at. That's the context of, of where we've come to. And in preparation this week, thinking about a bit of about the book more broadly and about this passage. Um, a helpful breakdown, if you want to have a bit of a, an overarching view of 2 Samuel in your mind, is, is pretty much like this. So the first 10 chapters are the good of David's reign. Uh, the next 10 chapters from 11 to 20 are the bad of David's reign. And it would be nice if the last bit was the ugly, because that would be dead easy to remember whether the good, the bad, and the ugly, wouldn't it? But it's not. So instead, it's the uncategorized. Uh, because they're kind of, just the chapters at the end just seem to be kind of, added on, they don't seem to be any particular order or fall into a particular category, but there were obviously things that needed to be said about David Simon's king, and so they're kind of uh, put in at the end. So you've got the good for the first 10 chapters, the bad, and I guess the uncategorized at the end. That's where we're, we're, we're at, so that means in chapter 2 we're in the good part of David's reign here, uh, and so the passage, we're going to split it into two parts effectively, verses 1 to 11, which we'll spend most of our time on actually in three sections, and then 12 to 32 in overview at the end. So look back down to verses 1 to 4. We're going to reread them because there's some important things to draw out here. Uh, first, the first thing we're going to draw out is from these verses. So in, in the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, go up. And David asked, where shall I go? And to Hebron, the Lord answered, so David went up there with his wives, with all of his men, and they settled in Hebron, uh, and they anointed, the tribe of Judah anointed David as king. So the first thing we see in that is that we've got a king here who seeks the word of the Lord. A king who inquires of the Lord, a king who then listens to what the Lord says, and a king who then obeys what the Lord says. Do you notice that with David? He goes, he wants to know what God is saying, so he can do it. When God speaks, he actually listens, and then when he's listened, he actually does something about it. So he's then obedient to what the Lord has said. And so there's, there's, there's that element to it, and there's an element to which that, that instruction to go up is key. So five times in the Hebrew, although it's slightly obscured in the English, you get the, the verb to go up. The, the, the point is, here is David ascending, not just in height, because Hebron was actually in the hills, but he's... The picture is of David ascending. Here he's coming to his throne. Although as we find out, it's not, it's not the throne of all of Israel yet, because only one tribe actually stick with him and anoint him as their king. But Hebron is also a significant place for David to go to, because Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah are all buried there. If you go back and read Genesis, you'll find that's the place where they were buried. And so actually, if here kind of again got here is God's king who's been anointed, coming back to a place of significance in the land, and we think, okay, it's getting back on track again. There's been it's, it's veered off a number of times throughout Israel's history, uh, and now we seem to be getting back to a point where this this is looking good, right? You're reading this as a as a as an Israelite, and you're going, oh right, they're back in Hebron, and and David's from the tribe of Judah, and he's listening to God. And, this is, this is good. This is hopefully going to work out well. The time has come for David to go up there. And actually he goes up to Hebron and the men of Judah are willing to anoint him king. In fact, they want to anoint him king. 
David had sent them some spoils of war back in 1 Samuel 30, verse 26 to 31. And now they step out and they take their stand with the Lord as they stand with the Lord's anointed. This is one commentator put it, should have a massive marker in the margin. In our margin, it should say something like major historical moment because this is actually the first time in all of scripture that God's chosen king reigns visibly on earth. Because you remember, Saul wasn't God's chosen. He's the first king, but he's not God's chosen king. He's the king the people choose. But here is God's chosen king, God's anointed king, reigning visibly on earth. And this is the first time that happens. Yes, it's small, which we'll come to in a minute, but he's reigning. His kingdom might be hidden up in the hills. It might only be one over one tribe, but it's there and it's established. So I think, first of all, learning from David, we can learn that, ask, actually, David asked the Lord before he acted, didn't he? David could have gone, right, Saul's finally dead. I don't have to play this game of cat and mouse anymore. Uh, and so, actually, I'll just go. I'll just go into the land and just start taking territory because I'm the king. But he doesn't. He, he asks the Lord first before he goes anywhere or does anything. I think there's a lesson to learn there, isn't there? How often do we ask the Lord before we make decisions, big or small, but maybe particularly big ones, I think quite often we just, we use our nous and we just do it. Too often I think we don't look to the wisdom of God's word and allow it to inform and shape our minds before we come to conclusions. When it comes to the career path we head down, do we ever consider how the ability uh, that will be affected of being involved in the local church or how much quality time we'll get to spend our family or do we simply go, it's a pay rise and it's a job that's secure and so therefore I'll take it. When it comes to where we choose to live, what is our main priority or main concern? Is it proximity to a local church we can get stuck into? Is it the way we can use what God has given us in a house to use it for hospitality and discipleship? Uh, is it about the community that we'll be living in and the opportunities to reach out to it? Or do we simply just go, let's go for the biggest one and the most comfortable one and that'll do? I think we can learn from the fact that when the Lord spoke to David, he obeyed. So the Lord speaks through his word all of the time. We, we don't need an intermediary priest. We've got one. <laughs> Jesus. He is already interceding for us and his word is now ours. We've got the inerrant and sufficient written word of God accessible to us every day and the Holy Spirit living in us to teach us what it means. Everything we need for life and godliness is here. And sometimes we go through life, don't we think, oh, I just need, if I just had this or I just had the other, make the Christian life easier, maybe. But actually, we've got all we need for life and godliness. God hasn't shortchanged us. He's given us everything we need here. That God calls us to obey him and he's told us look I love you with an everlasting love and I've promised that I'll provide for you all your needs and be with you always that should be enough for us shouldn't it knowing those promises and then God calling us to obey we know the character of the God who's called us to obey him I don't think we can learn from the fact that the Lord is at work to bring about his plans and purposes in his good time for his people. David had waited a long time to be king. We sometimes have to wait a long time for the Lord to do something in particular. Sometimes we plough a lonely furrow and it feels very frustrating and we experience little growth. But we can trust that the Lord will bring about his purposes, that the Lord will save his people. We simply have to keep doing the things he's called us to do, one after another. We preach and we, we preach the gospel and we pray, and then God does the work. We teach the truth and we love people, and God works through that. The results of what we do are not in our hands. They're in God's hands, and we have to trust his timing with them. So that's verse 1 to 4, verses 4 to 7, or the second half of 4 to 7 then teach us some more things here about David's kingship. So he's, he's inquired of the Lord, he's listened to the Lord, and he's obeyed the Lord. Now we find a king who acts wisely towards his people and then warmly invites them in to join him. Put down those verses again. 
When David was told that it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messages to them uh, to say, The Lord bless you for showing kindness by burying your master Saul. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness. And I too will show you the same favor because you've done this. Now then be strong and brave. Saul, your master is dead and the people of Judah have anointed me as king over them. First, Saul, first David praises them for being loyal to Saul. And remember how, how mad that is because Saul has chased David. Saul has tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. But David knew that he was the king, remember. He respected the Lord and Saul and trusted both his life and Saul's life into God's hands. The men of Jabesh Gilead uh, understand who Saul is too. In fact, for them, it was very personal because in, if you fire all the way back to the middle of 1 Samuel, when Saul actually started off quite positively as king, he rescued the men of Jabesh Gilead. He, he, he saved them. It was one of the first things he did as king. And now, in return for Saul's kindness to him, the men of Jabesh Gilead, if you were to read the end of uh, 1 Samuel 31, in something reminiscent of a Mission Impossible film, they, they head out at night and they take down the bodies of Saul and his sons off the wall of Bethshan, they carry them home and they bury them. So David in his commending of them here, he's not simply trying to butter them up. He's not aiming for a political move. David is genuinely thankful that they have honoured Saul and his sons. Second, David prays that the Lord will bless them. I mean, first of all, that's a great thing to pray, <laughs> that the Lord would bless them, right? That the Lord would show and continue to show to them steadfast love and faithfulness. But it's more than that because David is speaking about the Lord who is the covenant making and covenant keeping God. David is aligning himself with God and aligning the people of Jabesh Gilead with the Lord and saying, look, we're in this together. We have the same Lord. And then David promises to be good to them himself. He's saying that as their king, he would love and work for their good just as the Lord has called him to. David is promising to them the same kind of loyalty that they showed to Saul. And finally, and probably more significantly, David invites them to join him. See, with Saul gone, David says, look, you can continue to be faithful to your king. And this time you can be continued to be faithful to me as the Lord's anointed one, the one who has been waiting for quite a long time to become king. But isn't it a wonderfully warm invite from David? He doesn't coerce them. He doesn't threaten them. There's no power play from David. It's the blessing of the Lord and David's own character that are pushed to the front in this invite. See, in this story, I think we need to see ourselves in the shoes of the people of Jabesh Gilead. Again, as one commentator puts it, they are sandwiched in the text between the Lord's kingdom being established through David in Hebron and Abner's rival kingdom being established with Ishbosheth. And these guys are in the middle, literally, as the text is written, in the middle of the sandwich. And they've got a choice. They can join David, the Lord's anointed, or they can go with Abner. Who will they pledge allegiance to? And similarly for us, we, we stand always at that crossroads as human beings of who are we pledging allegiance to? Are we pledging allegiance to the Lord and his kingdom or to some other kingdom? Now that other kingdom could take oh, hundreds of forms. It can be our own little kingdom that we make ourselves. It can be any other kind of idol that we choose to submit to. But we have a choice to make as human beings, which kingdom are we going to align ourselves with? I'll think a little bit more about that towards the end. The last part of this first section, though, is about the establishing of, I guess, the rival kingdom. Abner basically wants to keep Saul's line going. Over and against what God has promised is the case, which Saul's line ends with Saul. Abner is still trying to push his own agenda. We've got someone who is opposed to the Lord. And we'd have understood if David just went for it, right? If David had just gone, right, forget this. <laughs> I'm just going to march in and smash them because I'm a bit sick of it. 
Saul is dead, David's next in line, we think he's got to go and do it. But again, David doesn't try and force the Lord's hand. David doesn't try and move up God's timeline to be his timeline. David patiently waits. In fact, he waits for seven and a half years. Again, more time waiting as only the king of Judah and not the king of all Israel. I think we find that hard waiting for God's timing, if we're honest. Especially when we think we need something now. To wait for something we think we need, or to wait out something when there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, is difficult. But once again, through David, we see that that is what is right and what is worth doing. Sometimes things happen very slowly, little step at a time. But the Lord is at work. Now, while there's stuff to learn from David, there's also stuff to learn from Abner. On the negative side, obviously. Abner basically stands deliberately opposed to the Lord. I mean, there's a hint in it in the name of, of Saul's son, Ishbosheth. I don't want to pronounce that. It's too many, th- too many thuz. At least you're not close enough for me to be spitting on you, so that's all right. Um, but Ishbosheth means man of shame. But he's really just a puppet king. Abner's the one pulling all the strings. Abner's the one setting all this up. Abner is trying to keep that doomed line of Saul going. But look what happens next as he does do that. He starts to, starts to go on the offensive. So when they come from, I should have had a map behind me really, but when they come from Mahanaim to Gibeon, they are marching a long, long way to come right onto the borders of Judah. It is, it is an act of war, really. They're saying, right, we're coming. We're coming to sort this out. We're coming to, to get David out of the kingship. It is a long way to march if you're not really planning on fighting. Then we get this, what seems a slightly weird thing of this 12 on 12 battle between the two sides where all 24 of them die, which just seems a bit bizarre. People debate what it's about. In one sense, it doesn't really matter whether it was part of combat to save there being a bigger war or whether the two generals were just having a bit of a you know laugh with the lives of their men the point is they all they all die and then and then there's a full-scale fight summarized in verse 17 before we then get this expansion of another story the battle that day was very fierce abner and the israelites were defeated by david's men now there's a couple of reasons that that then is followed you kind of think well that could be the end of chapter two right it's probably a nice way to end it It was a bit of a fight. David won it, full stop. But then from 18 to 32, you get this this long extended story. And I think there's two reasons for it. One, it's the first battle since David has become king. Kind of significant moment. And the other is because what happens in chapter 3. You need to know this story for chapter 3 to make sense. So you'll have to wait for that till next week. So what are we told? The three sons of Zeruiah are there. Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel, we're told, is basically the Usain Bolt of the era. Fleet-footed as a gazelle, we find. And we just see him literally sprinting after Abner. He wants the, he wants the boss. He wants to take out the kingpin of the army. And Abner's like, just go after somebody else. Stop chasing me. Just go and kill one of the others and take their armor. But Asahel won't listen. He just keeps running. And... and, and And Abner warns him, I imagine thinking, look, I really don't want to kill this guy. He's a young whippersnapper and I am an experienced general. He doesn't know what he's running into here. And she says, just just go after somebody else. But when he won't, when he just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going, we find that Abner just thrusts his spear backwards and the onrushing ass of hell is dead. He's got no chance. Understandably, his two brothers then want to avenge his death. So Joab and Abishai keep pursuing and they run and they run and they chase them to a hill and the Benjamites gather back round Abner to try and protect him because he's the general. And then Abner makes it out like, oh, why are you continuing the fight? Why don't you just leave it alone? Even though he's the one who started the fight in the first place. But actually Joab is not really at this point interested really in a fight. So when Abner suggests that, he says, okay, fine, we'll go home. And so they part and the story ends. Abner instigated the battle but then calls for a truce. It seems like Abner's cutting his losses. 
He's thought they might be able to go and you know, defeat David and he realises it ain't happening. But I wonder whether as well, thinking about what comes in chapter 3, is whether Abner is actually playing for time. He's playing for a bit of favour with David because, well, I might need some bargaining power. So if I can say, look, I, I, stopped, I stopped the battle, he might be able to carry some favour and, and maybe if David does win, he'll not, have to, uh, yeah, he'll not get killed. So Joab agrees, Dave, Abner is defeated, David's army wins. And he's thinking, ah, there's all sorts of stuff in there, and we could just dive into a bunch of details, but I'm, I'm not sure that's the point. Abner, I think, overall, shows us the nature of sin. Now, why do I say that? Well, because what is Abner doing, ultimately? Abner is setting himself up against the Lord's anointed one. Abner is a rebel against God, and that is ultimately the nature of sin, isn't it? That's what Abner's doing here. David is the Lord's anointed one. The one who should be followed, the one who should be obeyed as, the, as God's earthly king. But Abner wants nothing to do with that. Abner wants to set up his own little kingdom. Abner wants to keep rebelling. And that is what we do by nature as human beings. We rebel against God. We decide, look, I don't want God God's wants, I want what I want. I don't want to go God's way, I want to go my way. But as we find with Abner in this story, it is utter foolishness to stand opposed to the Lord's plans. Because what the Lord has said will come to pass. What the Lord has planned will happen, regardless of the schemes or the resistance of human beings. We see that David, even though he's king over only one tribe, his army wins. You can look up Psalm 2 later and it illustrates it perfectly for us. They stand in opposed to the Lord of all heaven and earth. But there's also something else to, for us to think about if we're, if we're already part of God's kingdom, if we're Christians. Because actually, by refusing to accept God's word about David's kingship and pursuing his own agenda, Abner is actually furthering division. He's keeping the nation divided. David's kingship was only over one tribe for seven and a half years because Abner stubbornly pursued his own agenda. There is a danger for us of resisting God's word and causing division. We can, through our sin, hinder the work of the gospel. We can, in wanting our own way and pushing our own agenda, make it so that actually the blessings of God that could be experienced aren't experienced. And so we need to check our hearts and we need to make sure we're keeping the gospel central. We, make sure, we need to make sure we're committed to the kingdom of God and not any other little kingdom. Because if we are committed to another little kingdom, it will cause problems. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, are we seeking to live out practically the unit that is ours? Or are we selfishly pursuing our own ends? Are we being a help or a hindrance ultimately to the life of the church and the furthering of the gospel? Now we could stop there, but there would be a big problem with stopping there. And I hope you know what the problem is by stopping there. Before I spell it out, I said nothing about Jesus or very little about Jesus. And yet, if we're to believe Jesus' own words in Luke chapter 24, everything is about Jesus. All of the Old Testament is about Jesus. The law and the prophets is all about him. And if we leave it there, all I've given you is a few moral hints and tips and lessons. Which are necessarily, not necessarily bad things, but without Jesus, potentially it could have been preached in a synagogue. So how does this passage point us to Jesus? Well, we've seen some of David's goodness here and some of his wisdom. But all of those things point ultimately to the greater king who was to come. The perfect king, the Lord Jesus. So how do we see those pointers to him? So the first one you see actually where well, Jesus repeatedly and consistently spoke with his father, didn't he? And perfectly obeyed him. Just as David inquired of the Lord, Jesus is constantly in communication with his father. My food, Jesus says in John chapter 4, is to do the will of him who sent me and finished his work. Perfect obedience to his father. And he says that multiple times in John's gospel. And Jesus' perfect obedience as king then took him all the way to the cross for us, as Philippians 2 makes clear. Jesus also waited patiently, right? 
Jesus trusted his father's timing and trusted his perfect eternal plan to the end. Jesus could have taken shortcuts at any point. If you've been reading through the big Bible read, you'll have just read Jesus' temptation in the wilderness in the last week. And actually, Jesus is offered the quick way out. Jesus is offered the glory without the suffering. Satan says, look, just do this. You can have it all. You don't have to do all that other stuff that, that's coming. But he doesn't. And as we looked at just before Easter, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus again is tempted to take the easy way out. But how does he end his prayer? My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he proceeded to hang on the cross in agony, crying out in anguish, enduring hell, because he perfectly trusted his heavenly father. To whatever we face, we can know that Jesus has endured more. However long we have to wait, however hard our suffering might be, and it can be incredibly difficult. And the waiting doesn't just disappear. It's not like God winds the clock forward and jumps us through it all. But what it does mean is that in, in Christ, knowing what Christ has been through, we can cling to that same hope that our Father has what is best for us and for his glory. Jesus also graciously invites us into his kingdom, doesn't he? I think that's one of the, one of the most wonderful parts of this passage in terms of the way we see David do that and a bigger picture of Jesus doing it. Jesus calls us to himself and to the benefits of his faithful love. When Jesus calls us to himself, he says, Come to me, all who you, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so we've all got a choice to make. Do we try and prolong that doomed kingdom? Or do we accept Jesus' wonderfully gracious invite to be part of his everlasting kingdom? See, Jesus lived and died and rose again, didn't he? So we could be part of his kingdom. He committed, his commitment on our behalf, his commitment to us is beyond anything anyone or anything in the world could offer. See, Jesus offers us exactly what we need. Mercy so we don't get what we actually deserve. Grace so we are blessed with blessings that we do not deserve. And forgiveness so that our sin is not held against us anymore. David was a good king. But Jesus is the great king. Jesus' kingdom also started small, didn't it? Even by the end of the Gospels, you've only got a little band of followers in occupied territory. Doesn't look very good. <laughs> Doesn't look impressive. Yes, Jesus did some wonderful things as we read in the Gospel. He healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he freed the demon possessed, he walked on water, he calmed the storm, he even gave life to the dead. And that is all wonderful, but even at the end of the Gospel, the kingdom is small. It doesn't come in glory and fullness immediately. It doesn't look strong or wise from the outset. His death didn't look like victory. And the message doesn't sound wise or intelligent. But it's how God works. That should encourage you, shouldn't it, as we reach out with the gospel. We might look and think, man, there are thousands of people around us who don't know Jesus. We're only small, what are we supposed to do? The areas of need are massive. Nobody's preaching the gospel here, there. But God is at work. It might look small, but that small seed will grow in God's good timing. And so we need to pray with urgency and with a priority for God's kingdom to come. We need to pray for the spirit to move and convict people of sin and to save and we need to pray that we would live out the gospel faithfully, day by day. Even if we don't see the results of that faithful living. Yes, we should learn from David. Yes, we should learn from any Old Testament characters, really, for good or ill. Yes, we should often look to be like them or learn from their mistakes. But ultimately, 
we should always allow our minds to run along the line from David, for example, to his greatest son, to Jesus, to the Messiah, to the Christ, to our Lord. And then we should not only seek to be like him, but also to worship him.